it's my pleasure and I uh, do uh, address your lunch bunch today and and thank them that work directly for the uh, Science Museum of Virginia or our uh, ad advocates that uh, just give you support. So just a quick background on me. I was in the Air Force for 28 years. Uh, my first flying was 141's uh, worldwide airlift. I then volunteered for Vietnam. I flew RF4's for uh, five years. And uh, from there, I was selected uh, into the SR-71 program, and I was in there for uh, six years. I accrued 777 hours over 65 operational missions and was an instructor pilot in the program when I left for the Pentagon. In the Pentagon, I worked uh, directly with the F-117, the F-22, and the B-2. I left the Pentagon, became an F-4E squadron commander in Georgia, uh, transitioned that squadron to F-16s. And my last flight in the Air Force was putting on a spacesuit one last time and taking a U-2 to uh, 70,000 feet and saying, thank you very much for a wonderful flying career in the Air Force. This will be what I'll be covering today. Quick history. When we first started collecting information, it was people uh, on the ground collecting information. Then it was on horseback. As technology came along, the first that really got into the vertical was hot air balloons. And the first time that hot air balloons were really used in uh, warfare was here in the Civil War with many missions flown by the uh, Union forces over uh, Virginia and some of the battle space. The first use of aircraft was in World War I, and that was the first use of aircraft. People, the adversaries and uh, allies said, I don't want those pictures of people taking pictures or collecting information. So they set up airplanes with guns, the advent of fighters. So this is when fighters came in. World War II, probably the two distinguished uh, reconnaissance airplanes I'll talk about was the Spitfire and the uh, P-38 modified, which was called the F-5. With this, we found out that when you fly at higher altitude, there's some real challenges, cold and moisture, which affects your film, the ability for the film not to jam and also for the film not to blur. The Cold War, so, the Soviet Union was a closed society. We, President Eisenhower and President Truman earlier needed information as where were they going? We modified current military airplanes. We lost over 14 airplanes and 170 crew members. The decision was made, we need to go design an airplane specifically to man this mission. That was the U-2. It was built and designed for reconnaissance and overflight. And President Eisenhower stepped up to the, the, the consequences. He approved every single overflight. There were only 24 because he felt that if they could shoot down a U-2, that they would feel that this might be an act of war. On the first flight of a U-2, over, and it was over Moscow in, in the deep part of the uh, Soviet Union, on the 4th of July, 1956, the Russians saw it on radar, and there were, the pictures showed missiles being deployed around Moscow, which clearly showed the U-2 was vulnerable. The CIA led a study about a re replacement aircraft, because that's what they uh, were looking at. The space programs were not ready yet. So the study group came back in 1957 and said, basically, sir, we need an airplane that doesn't fly at 450 miles an hour. It flies at Mach 3 plus, over 2,000 miles an hour, not at 70,000 feet, but at 80,000 feet and above. And we need an airplane that the Russians can't see on radar. Probably one of the aviation geniuses of the 20th century. Kelly Johnson uh, has all kinds of airplanes that he was directly responsible for. And obviously, we're going to get into the SR-71, which he felt was the culmination with the greatest challenge and the greatest achievement. These are some of the efforts by Kelly Johnson. You can see he was also built our first jet fighter in 143 days as World War II was going along. From the time the contract was led on the U-2, it was nine months to first flight, 20 months after the contract for the first operations. 1959, the contract on the what would be the A-12 was let, and 32 months later, the first flight in uh, Area 51. Amazing, you consider what was achieved. This is a symbol of the Skunk Works. 
came about from World War II, and their whole idea was so secret that they took the skunk as their uh, logo, that if any of the liquids, le secrets were leaked, we could smell it. And so this was a, uh, a kind of a morphing of the little Abner character. What was the goal? I mentioned Mach 3, 80,000 feet, a low radar cross section. The airplane actually achieved 3.3 Mach, above 85,000 feet. That's 2,200 miles an hour and one square meter. And that's when radar energy hit the side of, a, of an SR-71 and they're trying to track it. Effectively, about one square meter of energy would come back. To kind of give you an idea, an F-15 has about 15 square meters of energy coming back, an F-16 about seven square meters, and a drone typically is about one square meter. So this is early stealth technology for the United States. There were 13 A-12s built, five of them were lost. It was a single seat, uh, prim prim primarily uh, photo uh, imagery was collected. This led into the idea, the mission was so demanding and the airplane did not have the advanced navigation system that the SR-71 would have. There was a fly off, it was decided they would go with a two seat SR-71, the A-12, they both flew at the same speed, but the A-12 was 17,000 pounds lighter. So it flew uh, up around 90,000 feet and above, where the SR-71 was 80 to 85,000 feet. There were 32 built and 12 lost. And people unsurpassed technology and people often ask, well, that's a lot of airplanes. Well, think about it. These airplanes were the last major airplanes built in the United States using a slide rule. There was no modeling and simulation. So I had, you had to take out these airplanes and try them to see what would work and what wouldn't work. And obviously were, there were things they tried that ended up in the uh, loss of airplanes, but fortunately not the loss of lives. Here's the family of the Blackbirds. First, you have your A-12. First flew in 1962, operational from March of 67 until May of 68 out of Okinawa, Japan then replaced by its derivative, the SR-71. It was operational from March of 68, again, starting at Okinawa and then expanding worldwide until January of 90 when it was retired. There were three fighters developed, the YF-12A. It was actually very successful, but it was very expensive and there really wasn't a supersonic threat for it to go against. And the last one, two were built as M-21s that carried the D-21 Mach 3 drones. The idea was to launch a drone off the back to overfly uh, Red China. On the fourth flight during the test missions, the drone came up, lost its power, came back, crashed into the mothership, and uh, the mothership broke apart. The pilot survived. Unfortunately, the back seater, all his ejection systems worked perfectly, but the trouble is they landed in the Pacific Ocean. He'd never been given water survival, and he drowned. Kelly Johnson canceled the program at that day, on that day. I've already talked about the slide rule. The tremendous heat environment drives you. You can't use aluminum. So we had to make the airplane out of titanium. Titanium has the strength of steel and half the weight. The titanium sponge we bought came from the Soviet Union. They never knew where it came from. We had to develop a special fuel, JP-7. Most fuels ignite at minus 40 when you and I are on commercial airplanes. JP-7, because of the heat of the airplane, you have to get it above 140 degrees. You want a stable fuel. That is a fuel that's being used today for our hypersonic programs because it is stable. We had a whole fleet of uh, dedicated tankers, special modifications that could carry our special fuel. We also used the fuel as a coolant and as a hydraulic. You see, it's a big airplane. 60,000 pounds empty, 80,000 pounds of fuel. Most of the time, we did not take off with the max uh, takeoff weight of 140,000 pounds. We'd take off at 105,000 pounds, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. You can see the engines are heavy. They originally developed for the Navy, but when they realized it was a 6,000 pound engine, uh, to develop an airplane that you could use off a carrier was not practical. 
It's a two-person pilot navigator, which was the reconnaissance systems officer. Still the fastest airplane in the world. We set the speed record in, for the bicentennial in July 1976. We thought the record would last a couple of years. Here we are, 44 years later, it's still the record. When the airplane at uh, Uverhazi came over LAX to over Dulles was 64 minutes. This airplane was designed to fly at Mach 3. You can see some of the other records down below. When we set the speed records, when we took the airplane internationally for the first time, New York to London, hour 55, London to Los Angeles in three hours and 48 minutes, setting new world records, which are still standard. But you can see the profile. We can go about two hours between refuelings. The uh, New York to London was kind of tight. That's why there was a refueling shortly after to make that uh, facilitate. London to Los Angeles. There's one refueling over Goose Bay, Labrador. You see what the airplane looks like. Average temperature, almost 600 degrees. You can see it ranges from uh, the high 400s to over 1,200. The airplane grows three to four inches in length, an inch or two in width. That's why it's loosely put together. My front pie window in the front cockpit was 622 degrees. You see the yellowy color in the back of the airplane. That's approaching 1,200 degrees. Why black paint? You think about your pot belly stoves, black is your best radiating color. So by painting the airplane black at Mach 3.2, even though the outside temperature is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit, we could reduce the temperature of the surface of the SR by 50 degrees. The oil has to be preheated before we start the engines. And as I said, the fuel is used as a coolant through the heat exchangers to cool the air crews, the sensors, and the hydro and is also used in our hydraulic systems to control the uh, afterburner nozzles because it's so hot back there you couldn't use a hydraulic fluid. The stealthiness: twenty percent of the surface of the airplane. You see all the surface areas, the sharp edges, are all covered with a special composite that basically absorbs the radar energy and and re prevents it from being reflected back to the uh, source. Next. You can see here how those edges, the radar energy comes in, it bounces and can't get out. We focused on the fire control energy from an air-to-air -air radar and also from a ground missile radar. And if you launch the missile at us, what happened when our defensive systems came aboard, we would basically deny your ability to talk to your missile. And think about it back in the 70s and 80s, those were not. Uh, missiles that could uh, navigate by themselves. They needed updates from the ground radar or air-to-air -air radar to be successful. It's a double delta. The forebody of the airplane creates 35% of the lift at altitude. And the nose is about six degrees up, just like a boat in a lake to be able to create that lift. If you look at the shape, it's the shape of the uh, space shuttle. And both of them set off the same type of sonic boom. It's a very sharp boom, boom, that occurs on the ground, which we have no control over. We called it the sound of freedom because when we did overflights, we liked the people down below to know that uh, we had made passage and they were probably doing something counter to either US or NATO policy. The steepest bank turn we could do in the airplane was 45 degrees, because once the airplane was heated up, we could only pull 1.7 Gs, which basically is a 45 degree bank turn. At 45 degrees to do a turn, it takes us 170 miles to turn around. Part of the success of this airplane was sensors all over the airplane that monitored how the systems were working. It was all analog, 650. You can see what the tape looks like when we landed. But what this allowed, we didn't have to fly this airplane and have a system fail before they replaced it. Our maintenance people could look and say, oh, Look, the generator is starting to struggle under heat or the one of the fuel pumps. Today, when you and I fly in an airliner, most of them have sensors on board and many of them, they're so sophisticated that they will radio ahead and tell the landing base that a particular airplane has a problem and they can maybe have the part awaiting so they can quickly fix the airplane and turn it. Tire failure was a big problem on this airplane of the 12 SR-71s that were lost, 
Three of them were on takeoff or takeoff uh, testing, and one of them on landing. Those are good tires. They're good for about 15 landings. We fill them full of 415 PSI nitrogen because as the tires heat up in flight, if we didn't fill them with nitrogen, the oxygen in the air would bond with the rubber and the tires. And when we came back, we would have deflated tires and you know what that would lead to. This is the assembly line at Burbank, California, assembling the uh, SR-71s, which were then taken up to Groom Lake, uh, transported initially in uh, some secret uh, form. And once we announced the program, they, they could then be flown from Burbank up to uh, Edwards Air Force Base or, or Groom Lake, Area 51. When you build a stealth airplane, it inherently becomes unstable. So think of the SR-71. The center probe is like any airplane that measures the, two, the, the dynamic pressure and the static pressure and tells you how fast you're going. The side probes, you see there's a hole on the bottom and the top in either side because this airplane is unstable in pitch and yaw. So as the air is passing over that side probe, it's going to a stability augmentation system that is putting fine inputs into the airplane to keep it under control. And that doesn't matter if you're hand flying the airplane or if you're on autopilot. I was really disappointed when I got in the program and could sit in the cockpit for the first time. I thought it would have really a super cockpit. This is a 1960s fighter cockpit. All analog, round dials. The most important thing is that screen in the middle. They filmed our missions and put it on 35 millimeter film and it advanced at our ground speed and on the film there would be when the turns coming up how much fuel we should have if there was special timing for the mission it was uh quite a wonderful system which the a12 the predecessor did not have a better look at the cockpit angle of attack was very important when we were cruising to get that lifting effect we were using six degrees of angle of attack the pilot was responsible for the fuel remaining. As I said, the center of gravity was very important because when you're supersonic, you moved your gravity back a lot to be with your center of lift. Also notice on the stick, which was a very heavy stick, it's not pitch and roll, it's pitch and yaw. Once we set the roll, we hardly ever touched it. Let's step into the future. This is your F-35 cockpit. Look at that. Hands-on stick and throttle. The pilot can set on that screen, eight by 20 inches, up to 12 subsets with, that they want. The helmet he's wearing, or she's wearing, it's virtual. We've set infrared sensors around the outside of the airplane. So sitting there, you can look straight down and see what's below you or around you. It is truly amazing what this airplane provides you. This is what the RSO's cockpit looks like. He's got a view sight that can look straight down. His radar display, and the radar is not air to air, it's air to ground doing mapping. You see his moving map display is a lot bigger than mine as the pilot because he has a lot more details of cameras on and other things to do. When we talked to the tankers to start our rendezvous, it was secure. We both set in special codes into the outside world. All they heard was noise. The ANS panel, that stands for Astro Inertial System, and you're going to see more about it. The defensive systems are also located in the back cockpit, one of his primary responsibilities. They come out, they would load all the information in, took about an hour 45. There's a glass window you see on the top. The star tracker, there were star logs in there of 59 of the prominent stars in the either northern or southern sky. Once we started engines, did our checks and pulled out of the hangar on a sunny day, within two minutes, it would look through the blue sky and lock on. We guaranteed the president and our leaders 300 plus feet anywhere in the world traveling at 2,200 miles an hour. It was an absolutely amazing system. Did they shoot missiles at us? Yes, they did. Did fighters come up? I never personally had a missile fired at me. Fighters came up regularly. The forward circle is a receiver. We're looking for air to air and surface to air radars. The lower antenna you see there is our jammer one of the most powerful jammers of the time. And so once a missile was launched at us, we would then jam all its communication. We were not allowed to turn on that jammer over much of the United States 
I see many faces there that are of my age. Think about it when people used to have TV antennas. If our jammer was on and we flew over your house, you'd lose your TV signal for uh, 10 to 15 seconds at least. This is one of the antennas for communication, but it was also one of the ways that obviously that we could get range and bearing to our tankers. And we could pick that up over 300 miles back because you're going to see later we had to start down from altitude about 220 plus miles back so we could slow and cool the airplane to come down for the refueling. Because the fuel had such a high flash point, we used a chemical, triethylene boring, TEB. So that flash you see in there is that's 3,000 degrees. Once JP7 was ignited, it burned wonderfully. But there was very little fire hazard associated with it. And you're going to see later about all those rumors that the airplane leaked. The airplane leaked considerably, but there was no fire hazard associated with it. On my throttles, there were counters. I was guaranteed 16 shots of this triathlon boring. You had one shot when you started the engine, and every time you lit the afterburner, as you see here, another shot would go in to make sure that the fuel ignited uh, correctly. This is, the, this is the engine, the J-58, originally a Navy engine, modified with six bypass tubes, so it became a, a uh, bleed bypass. Think of it as transitioning into a ramjet, but not fully. It comes off the fourth stage there and dumps into the front of the afterburner section to add cooling air and just air to burn the fuel that hasn't been burned. The engine grows six inches in length and two and a half inches in width because of the tremendous heating. That core engine is 2,000 degrees. The afterburner section is 32 to 3,400 degrees. We could stay in afterburner up to an hour, hour and a half, hour 45. No jet engine even today can withstand these kinds. But there's a price. Every 100 hours, these engines had to be inspected. And every 400 hours, they had to go back and be rebuilt. No engine to date can absorb supersonic air. So at 1.6 Mach, it doesn't matter if you're an F-15 or an SR-71, you have to adjust the airflow. So when it hits that compressor phase, it's subsonic. So at 1.6 Mach, this spike is going to start moving aft and double the size of the opening and reduce by over 50% the throat. You'll see in the next uh, diagram how that works. Now watch the uh, spike move aft. Okay, when we get to about 2.2 Mach, we've got to help transition this engine from being a normal jet engine, a turbo engine, into a turbo bleed bypass. So there's a whole series of things that are either manual or automatic that are going to take place to help us with the flow and adjust the engine. I'm not going to talk about the individual ones, but I'll show you the different things that take place so we can transition the engine into this uh, higher supersonic flight. Subsonically, all the outside vents and everything are open because the engine is not getting enough air. So we're sucking everything in. At 3.2 Mach, everything is closed down and I've only got a small bleed of air going overboard. So at 80,000 feet, even though it's only 0.4 pounds per square inch, I'm getting 14 to 18 pounds per square inch at the compressor face. Absolutely amazing recovery up there. And look at the difference between 2.2 Mach, your engine is producing 74% of your effective thrust. At 3.2 Mach, it's your RAM that's producing about 83% or 81% of the affected thrust. You had to be a volunteer, 2,000 hours, five to seven years. They liked multiple aircraft experience. You had to send in your personnel, your flying, in your medical records, they did an evaluation. If they liked what they, they saw, they would bring you back for a week-long evaluation. You had to pass first a two-day astronaut's physical at Travis Air Force Base. You went through a whole series of interviews. The We pilots had to fly with current SR pilots in the T-38 so they could assess how we handled the airplane. It's a low-G airplane. We then went home and hoped, because we trained two to three crews a year. so. What was we needed next was a open space. This is a training airplane. You see the that's where I, as an instructor pilot or any instructor pilot, this had dual controls. A normal SR-71 has no controls in the back seat. The navigator cannot fly the airplane. When we were home, we flew three, typically three SR flights a month. 
in one four-hour simulator. I'm here to tell you the simulator was uh, a difficult. They challenged you on all kinds of emergency procedures. You also got eight up to eight T-38 flights. Overseas, we flew SRs as required by maintenance and operations. This is my uh, navigator, John Murphy. We flew together for four years. You see the big glass window on the front. We'll talk later about the country's camera. The significant milestones you see, first flight, first Mach 3 flight, first crew flight, first 3.2 Mach, first 45 degree. 45 degree terms were uh, kind of tricky. And then the last thing you uh, they introduced you to was night flying because it was tricky. Because we were all over fly hostile countries, we went through special intelligence school. I also went through water survival in a spacesuit. And I'm here to tell you, if your flotation device does not work, you're going to the bottom because there's no way to paddle hard enough to keep yourself floating. Uh, because of the Gary Powers experience, we went through uh, special covert communications so we could possibly uh, communicate if we had ended up in hostile hands. I also been exposed to interrogations, uh, types of torture. I've been waterboarded, so I understand what that's about. We also prepared the family. I had to live on base. My wife had a day long course on what the government would do in the Air Force. We typically went overseas at six weeks at a time, multiple times a year, averaged 150 days a year. My last year in the program, I was overseas 210 days. You can see what the responsibilities of the pilot and the RSO, the navigator had the sensors, the navigation, the tanker rendezvous, the defensive systems, the checklist, and did most of the radio calls in flight. This picture was taken waiting for a launch codes for an overflight of Cuba. And the launch codes had to come from Washington, DC. So I'm talking to the crew chief and I don't even know this picture is taken. We originally used Gemini suits. This is John and I again. The suits weighed about 45 pounds. We had a wonderful rocket ejection seat in this airplane. So it didn't matter if you were on takeoff roll or 80,000 feet at the full speed of the airplane, you could safely leave the airplane. We never had an Air Force fatality. Only one test engineer was killed testing in the SR-71. And it was because the airplane completely came apart on a test flight. David Clark, our modern suits, the 1030s, these are the same suits that the shuttle astronauts are going to use on the first four flights, test missions in Columbia, because they did not have their own suits. The suits came in 12 sizes. They were adjustable. They lasted about 12 years. The inner layer was nylon. You put on cotton long johns because you're going to perspire. The inner layer was nylon. That would be touching your body. There was a rubber layer because that's going to hold the pressure if, you, if the suit has to be inflated to give you an artificial environment. On top of that, something that looked like a, uh, a fishnet. This is what was adjustable. Keep the rubber bladder in the right shape. The outer layer you see there that's that uh, golden color. It's good to 800 degrees. So if you had to eject through a fireball, it would provide you some temporary protection. There are many fire departments today around the country that are using this material as a way to help them when they are fighting fires. See the front of the suit, the, con the uh, control there on the right, that's where the vent air comes in. You can control your, your temperature. That uh, silver on the left, you can inflate the suit. You know, particularly on longer flights, Parts of your body were not getting as much uh, ventilation air, so you could inflate the suit and kind of lift yourself up a little bit. The strap in the center is to keep your helmet from riding up. When the suit inflates, it wants to pull your head out of the helmet. You put on cotton surgical gloves. Your inner glove had rubber, and then it was either uh, leather or the uh, Fipro material. The helmet weighed an additional 10 pounds. There's a dual oxygen system. Just like when you're driving around now as we go into winter, our moisture in our breath would cause the visor to fog up. So in the visor, the glass or plexiglass, there's a fine gold filament that's heated to keep the moisture off it. This was our identification. The only thing we carried with us was on our shoulder. When you flew an operational mission in the airplane, you would as a pilot or an RSO, you are now 
given this patch that you could wear on your normal flight suit, not your space suit. Anybody associated with the program, the people that suited us up, the planners, our maintenance people, our tankers. This was the SR-71, kind of call it the program patch. This was a map carried by the pilot when he set the speed record from uh, Los Angeles or uh, London to Los Angeles. The cockpit was really small. So if we had had to uh, navigate this airplane using a map, it would have really been quite a challenge. Before a mission, the day before, we'd go in and meet with a computer planning group. When you're traveling at 30 to 35 miles a minute, you're not throwing out maps on the table and stripping them and writing lines. It's done by a computer. You would check the route, your accident, your targets, your camera points, fuel, tank, your turns, any special rules. If you're flying a stateside training mission, you'd file at base operations and then head to where our suits were carried. On an operational mission, you had a full briefing, mission briefing, the weather, your tankers, your intelligence update, any special operationally or political. We were very much driven by rules or restrictions that came from the State Department. Two hours prior, you come in, you had to pass a physical before every flight. They're concerned about your sinuses, your heart rate, blood pressure. You then had a a, uh, high-protein, low-bulk meal, steak and eggs. They briefed you on your airplane. An hour 15 prior, you'd come downstairs, take out, put on your cotton long johns. You would then come in and there were two technicians that would help you suit up. The suit is laying on the floor. You came in like a coverall from the back. They would then tighten the straps. The big seal in the back would be zipped up. You would then be putting your helmet on. And then you'd put your cotton gloves would come on. And then your last thing would be your helmet. And next possible would be the testing. They would hook you up to make sure your oxygen, your your suit pressurized, it didn't, wasn't leaking. Was your communication working? Was your face heat working? Checking all the zippers for possible leaks. When they inflated you, you looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. And when we had school kids come in, particularly the boys wanted to come and punch us because they thought it would be really soft. When the suit inflates, it's actually pretty rigid. Typically, you're in the suit four to six hours. Most of our missions were two and a half to to four and a half hours. Uh, Some of the missions could be up to 13 hours. My longest mission was 10 hours and 20 minutes, and I was in the suit uh, just short of 12 hours. I was glad to give the suit back to our physiological support people. You were literally installed in the airplane. There's a technician on either side. And as one person does it, the other one checks it off to make sure, because if some of these connections weren't right or straps not right or right, it could cost you your life. So this was an important process. And these guys and gals were really professionals. Because the engines were so heavy, we used a pair of Buick Wildcats tied in tandem with a drive shaft that came up. These engines would fire. It sounded like you were at a racetrack. When the engine hit 1,000 RPM, you'd advance the throttle to start. A shot of uh, the TEB would go in. And once the start cart sensed that the uh, engine was now over 3,000 RPM, the drive shaft would immediately drop away. As I said, the airplane leaked. Because of the temperature, we couldn't use rubber bladders. So they sealed the tanks as best they could with silicone. Well, the silicone with heating would become embrittled. So your, one of your greatest risks around the airplane was slipping on this JP-7 because it was pretty slick. Now, as we went to start engines, which took about 30 minutes, our face plates would come down and they would time us because in that 30 minutes from engine start until we were out to the runway to take off, we would reduce the nitrogen in our blood by 50 percent because our cabin pressure is going to be at 26,000 feet, much like a diver coming up from a dive. If we don't reduce the nitrogen in our blood, we could be subject to the bends. You see, the biggest part of the airplane are the engines. As far as the drag goes, the main body, you can see it looks like a boat because, again, it's a lifting body. What's your greatest sense of speed? It's on takeoff. You're clear for takeoff. You light those two powerful afterburners. In 20 seconds, you're going to go 4,500 feet. You're going to lift off doing 240 miles an hour, and you'll pass through 20,000 feet less than two minutes from the time that you release the brakes. If you climb all the way to 75,000 feet, 80,000 feet, 
going to take you another 17 minutes. You'll burn a third of your fuel and you're going to go 360 miles. People say, why does it take so long? Think about it. At 20,000 feet, you're doing 400 miles an hour. You're going to climb 60,000 feet and you're going to level off at 2,150 miles an hour. So you're climbing and accelerating at the same time. It's the only airplane in the world that can do that. I wish I could take you up. It's an absolutely beautiful sight. You can see 300 plus miles in any direction. The sky is uh, black above you. At night, the sky is absolutely twinkling, twinkling because 90% of the stars that are up there, we can't see because the atmosphere filters them out. Whole variety of sensors. We'll talk more about the sensors. The airplane was really designed with utility. We have optical sensors. We have radar sensors. We have electronic sensors to gather radar and uh, communication signals per se. The country's camera, that big glass you saw there, the picture was 72 miles wide. That's that big blue stripe through there. I could film 100,000 square miles in an hour. The yellow squares you see out there are radar, and that's good to about one foot imagery in the spot, but you can't see people. The yellow are the optical cameras, and if you were outside your house now on a sunny day and I flew over at 80,000 feet plus and I'm doing 35 miles a minute, I will take your picture and I will, if you're standing beside your car, I will see you. I cannot recognize your face, but most of the time I can tell you what kind of a car you're driving. The, the resolution was anywhere from uh, four to six inches, and sometimes it was down closer to two inches. This is that big nose camera. Look at the photography down below of this uh, boating area. If you could see the, the raw imagery, you could see it much more clearly. They, you could differentiate many things on the decks of those boats. This is a synthetic aperture radar. Prior to this, it was blobology. But look at the imagery that you could see. So it didn't matter if it was day, night, or weather. We could see pretty clearly what was on the ground. If there were airplanes parked on a, a ramp somewhere or a submarine in a sub pen, we could pick that up. This was the optical camera that I was talking to you about that could take your picture. One was on either side of the airplane and the, the master computer on the airplane knew where to turn the lenses to, to pick up the targets. Uh, we couldn't play Kodak moment because typically coming back, we might be taking easily over a thousand images in a two hour flight. This gives you an idea of the camera again. Look at the lines in the parking lot. This is the uh, Seattle uh, Sea Dome. And you can see cars down there. If you saw the original negative, it would be much clearer. Got to come down to refuel. 220 miles back, about 10 minutes to descend to cool, to get down to 25,000 feet. Refueling is 12 to 15 minutes. We transferred 1,000 gallons a minute. You see the air refueling receptacle was well back of the pilot. Without our tankers, this airplane would not have been significant. Every two hours, we had to come down and refuel. Our tankers were absolutely amazing. There were almost 26,000 refuelings during the history of the program, and none of us are aware of any time when our tankers were not there for us. My longest mission, <clears throat> Northern California, the north coast of Russia. We never overflew Russia or Red China. I had five refuelings. I took fuel from 15 tankers. I flew over 15,000 miles and they figured I consumed over 72,000 gallons of fuel. There are lights on the bottom of the tanker that could give us direction to come forward or aft or up or down. Of particular use, not so much during the day, but at night it was critical. You see the airplane leak fuel. This is fuel coming out of the tanks, again, because we didn't have rubber bladders. This is the trainer aircraft. You see that elevated rear cockpit. This is one of my students. I'm in that rear cockpit flying this mission over El Paso. Here's the operation, Reco strategic reconnaissance, collecting information for our national leaders. Diplomatic, can you imagine sometimes we were tasked to overfly heads of state when they were greeting each other, to purposely boom them, to send a message that uh, they were doing things counter to US uh, policy. Uh, I've never seen the picture, but I understand there's a great one of Brezhnev uh, talking to Cuba with an SR crossing overhead.
These were our main bases, Beal, Kadena, Milden Hall. Seymour Johnson was, we used it, the Arab-Israeli war because the Europeans wouldn't allow us to fly out of Europe. I'm one of only two pilots that ever took the SR-71 to Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean. You can see the main operating spots and you can see where the hot spots are. That shouldn't surprise you at all. This shows you a typical route out of Okinawa, Japan during uh, the Vietnam War. Two refuelings swing down over the northern part of South Vietnam, over North Vietnam, down, refuel over Thailand, and then head back. This is the long missions. These are the Arab-Israeli War, the longest missions we flew, 10 and a half to 14, uh, 11 hours and uh, 20 minutes, up to six refuelings. In route, we are flying at Mach 3. Next slide. You can see when we got over the target area, we'd accelerate the 3.15 Mach, and we had to be above 70,000 feet, which we were. Out of Japan, flying along the Korean Peninsula, we were typically at Mach 3. We'd come up, turn south of Vladivostok, or go by Vladivostok and come back. We also flew at a higher speed up to Petropopolov, and we're looking at the subpins and other of the uh, uh, far uh, eastern uh, Soviet fleet that was there. Flying over Cuba, typically every 45 days. Also flew down over uh, Panama when we were, flew over Noriega's to remind him three days in advance of booming him. Uh, it's a good time to leave because the Marines are going to arrive pretty soon. Now, he basically agreed to leave before the Marines had to make an aggressive landing. Because of the narrowness over flying over West Germany or up in the Baltic Sea, we had to fly at 2.8 Mach. And so we are typically between 70 and 78,000 feet because we were at the slower speed. Up off Russia, again, we didn't overfly Russia. We were looking for the submarines and other surface fleets in Murmansk coming out of England. And we would be at, uh, because of the cold air, we were often even above, uh, above 85,000 feet. Some of the guys were up at 86 and 87,000 feet because you let the airplane fly at the altitude it wanted to fly at because of the outside air temperature. This is the Tripoli. You see how we came in to do the post strike after the fighters had struck uh, Libya. Come into land, your approach speed at 175 knots, which is about 195 miles an hour. You touch down at 155, which is about 175. If you don't have, if the drag chute doesn't work, it takes 10,000 feet of runway to stop this airplane. With the drag chute, we come to stop in about four to 5,000 feet. The brakes were undersized, so one of the first things they did was put these air coolers on our brakes to prevent the tires from deflating. The sensors, in this case, our defensive systems are downloaded. You see they're on pulleys, and they lower down to a dolly to take them into servicing or into the photo lab. The film is taken into the photo lab in the dark. It's cut into 500-foot lengths. With cotton surgical gloves, you go the whole length to make sure there's no tears or anything because you don't want to put the film into the processor and all of a sudden have it jam and lose all that information you collected. Symbol of our wing that now flies U-2s and uh, Global Hawks. There was our tankers and ourselves back then. Our squadron was the first reconnaissance squadron, the oldest military aircraft squadron in, in the United States, formed in 1913. Why was the airplane retired in 1990? I would say three reasons. One, the Cold War came to an end, and we thought we'd be much more peaceful. The second thing was costing $85,000 an hour to operate because of all the systems, our tankers, and everything else. Now, when I flew the program in 75 to 81, we figured it was $50,000 an hour. So you can see it's gone up. I think the real reason the airplane was retired was we never had a real-time data link. So as we collected the information, the airplane had to land somewhere, the information had to be processed, and then sent it to the leaders. When I flew a special mission for President Carter into the Middle East out of England in 1979, when Saudi Arabia and Yemen were fighting, he monitored our whole flight. When I landed back in England, they downloaded the cameras, put it on a waiting airplane, flew it across the Atlantic processed in Washington, D.C., and I, the photo interpreters told me it took them 12 hours because my film was almost two miles long in that nose camera. So here you have a president that's awaiting the information, 
and he probably had to wait 24 to 36 hours to see any imagery at all of what was happening. Today, the metric to our president is less than 10 minutes. I thank you for your time, and I'm ready for questions now. Have you ever experienced an unstart in the SR-71? And if so, what was that like? It was violent. Uh, I had almost 100 unstarts because I used to do some of the test missions. What happens, the shock comes out of the inlet in one engine. So one engine is producing 100% thrust. The other one is about 30%. The airplane starts a violent yaw. And in one set of unstarts, it was so violent, it broke my sun visor on my spacesuit because the side of the cockpit smashed in my face because it caught me off guard. Wow. And if, if they continued, it, it would cause, could cause the airplane to become twisted. This particular sequence of unstarts, I ended up losing one of my main hydraulics, and I had to land at Osan Air Base, a, a U.S. Air Force base in South Korea, uh, because of the damage that had been done to the airplane because of the unstarts. Okay, so that kind of brings me to another question we had. Uh, so before this aircraft was revealed to the public, uh, what kind of emergency plans would the pilots have had for landing if they experienced an emergency in flight and had to land? What they would do was that if at all possible, land at an Air Force base, and they would have passed the information on. Like when I landed in South Korea, they were waiting for me. When I landed there, there was a hangar already ready for me. So I literally taxied off the runway, taxied up and taxied into the hangar and they closed the doors behind me. Um, but, and this was after the airplane had been acknowledged. Before the airplane was acknowledged, it was even more secure like that. They would really hide its presence. And then typically uh, the airplane might return home at night. So there'd be very few people out there that would see it depart. Okay. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about the comfort level on your pressure suit? Uh, um, I have over a thousand hours in the, in the pressure suits. You got used to them. I mean, that was your work suit. You didn't make fast motions because if you made fast motions, you were fighting the suit. So your, your motions were very deliberate, but it, it was fairly comfortable. Uh, if you're claustrophobic, this was not the program to be in. Uh, you know, there was a face seal around your seal because we breathed 100% oxygen through the whole flight. And as we exhaled, our exhale went down into the suit itself because the main suit was pressurized, if it was pressurized, with uh, ambient air per se. So uh, we had an access port on the right-hand side. So we drank water during the flight because... 100% oxygen plus being in a pressure suit, you're going to lose weight. A typical flight, you'd lose two to three pounds, a two and a half to four and a half. That ten, uh, nine hour and 45 mission I flew for President Carter, I lost seven pounds. That was the most I ever lost. So, uh, and on longer flights, over five hours, we carried, we called tube food. Looked like a tube of toothpaste, had a tube on it. It fit through that same hole we could drink with. So, every about every two hours, because you were really busy flying this airplane, we would raise the, uh, sh you know, the sugar level back in our uh, bloodstream, keep our energy level up where we wanted it. All right. So uh, can you address, I mean, we talked a little bit about uh, the, why the aircraft was painted black. Uh, can you address why the outside temperature of the aircraft would get so high? It's because the air molecules sliding along the side of the airplane, it causes friction and it just heats the airplane up. You saw the high temperatures of the front part of the airplane. There was no heating coming from inside the airplane to cause that. It was strictly the skin friction as the air is trying to pass separating around the airplane and passing around it going back. Obviously, in the back from the engines, there's some heat being added also. Okay, and uh, did the Soviets or any other country, do they have anything that could even approach the speed of the SR-71? The big 25s could come up, and they could get up to Mach uh, 3.0. And they tried a number of times. I saw them to try to come up and intercept us. Uh, because of their wing structure and that, they couldn't get up as high as we were. 
And the other part is they could only stay at Mach 3 for a short time period because the airplane was basically overheating and they burned up both their engines. Now they get back to home base, but they'd have to pull the engines out and replace them because they were no longer any good. Uh, can you talk about what other planes you flew before the Cold War? Well, I was basically flying airplanes in the Cold War. I didn't fly anything before the Air Force. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I started out flying 141s worldwide, which was a great way to learn to fly because of all the different kinds of airfields we went into and stuff. And then the RF-4 was like a, an F-4, but it was just full of cameras. It had no defense. Uh, it had no missiles or any of uh, those kind of things on it. And then, of course, afterwards, I uh, had, had an F-4 fighter squadron, which was really a great experience. Okay, and uh, how much feedback were you able to get regarding the actual usefulness of the information that you gathered? Uh, there, uh, periodically, we would get a little information, but Jim, they tried, when I first came in the program, we were not even allowed to look at our photography. And the whole idea behind that was, if you end up in enemy hands, we want you to know as little as possible um, on targeting. But we, I kind of convinced them, because most of us came out of our, RF-4s, we said, maybe if we see our photography in that, we can fly the airplane better so that your photography will improve. So they finally relented. So uh, the last four years I was in the program, we could actually go over to where the uh, photo interpreters were working and we could see what we had collected. All right, Buzz, it looks like we're out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Colonel Carpenter, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, please join us next week on Wednesday, January 13th at noon. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Richard Groover, who is going to be uh, presenting on his research on coyotes in Virginia. And you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for coming.